Welcome to Municipal Affairs, the show dedicated to delving deep into the matters that shape municipalities. Now, as we bid farewell to 2023, Jennifer Burgess and I, our political pundit, will be sitting down and talking about the three biggest news stories from across Alberta and how they impacted municipalities this year. We'll also be talking about some of the news stories that didn't make the news as much as they should have, and also a major news story that happened outside of Alberta's boundaries. This is Municipal Affairs Year in Review. Jennifer, thank you so much for doing this. It is the end of the year, so we wanted to look back on some of the biggest political municipal news stories of 2023 here in the province of Alberta. Uh, it's always a pleasure to sit down with you and talk about the municipal issues that are going on in the province. So thank you so much for taking time of your schedule to do this again. So happy to be here. Awesome. So for those who are listening, as I said in my introduction, uh, we have the top three stories that we believe were the biggest news stories municipally across Alberta of 2023. We sort of have a hidden story that we think should have gotten a little bit more attention. And then also what we thought was the biggest news story municipally across Canada. So I'm going to throw it over to Jennifer first for her third story that she believes was the biggest thir- uh, story in Alberta uh, municipally. So Jennifer, Jennifer, what was your third municipal story that you thought was big news municipally here in Alberta? Yeah, Chris, you know, it's hard to narrow it down. You made me pick three and that was not easy because it's, you know, you kind of have to decide, are you going to go with sort of the spicy, exciting ones or, you know, the more practical ones? So for for this one, I picked a more practical one. I think we're talking about municipalities. We have to talk about property tax and revenue um, because it's just been all over the map uh, this year in terms of how municipalities are trying to address this increasing revenue problem. We saw in our city council budget here and I'm based in Calgary and that was kind of the number one topic. They were trying to figure out this formula between um, property tax and business taxes and argued either way, both sides ended up with a small increase to property taxes. Edmonton did something similar. Um, Red Deer taxes actually went down, but I think, you know, what is interesting is less kind of these little percentages all over the province and more just how this is really becoming clear it's an issue. This is like the only way municipalities can bring in revenue. It's clearly not working, you know, across the board. You see every council just grappling with how do you make this formula work? At the end of the day, there's only one taxpayer. You can only tax people so much. Um, And I think we're going to get to see some really creative um, ideas from municipalities. That's where I hope this is going. Um, I caught an article um, from St. Albert, where they're thinking of making one of their utility services public, um, which is really cool. And, you know, kind of the way those... uh, assets were run originally. So we might see more of that across the province with municipalities sort of taking back a bit about how they are in revenue, because I think it was clear for all councils, this just, it wasn't working this year. Well, one of the things that I I, 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 I was looking at that too, the property, the, the tax rate increases mm-hmm. that a lot of the municipalities are dealing with right now. We should note that Alberta is not alone in this. This is a cross-country thing. Uh, Soyuz has a 39% tax increase this year that they're going to be pre- they presented to their uh, council, and the, it has passed. So 7.8% is large, but it's not the largest. Mm-hmm. What I found interesting when most of these municipalities are talking about the budget is LGFF formula, which is the infrastructure formula for a lot of municipalities, still has not been agreed upon by the minister and the two organizations, Alberta Municipalities and RMA. I did reach out to the uh, minister's office, Minister Rick McIver's office, and asked him about when this is going to happen. And the only confirmation I got was by the end of 2023, which is now. So Ticking down a little. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. So I want to ask from your perspective, while we are waiting for this seven hundred million dollars in change for LGFF, which is the local local uh, the local fiscal framework that municipalities get from the province to help with infrastructure, with help with funding, do you think we could see some changes around these property taxes, or do you think these municipalities who have already set their tax rate for next year is kind of set in stone, and the extra funding that they'd be getting from the province is just a cherry on the top? Yeah, great question. I think, you know, it depends. It's probably different across municipalities. I know here in Calgary, it's just, it's such a political conversation. I don't think a lot of council will be willing to go back to the table and do that again. Um, But I think next year, you know, each budget cycle, it's going to be a conversation because I I was thinking about this too in this context. And what we do know about the LGFF is it's tied to provincial revenue um, and the 
you know, how they're bringing in resources. And so if I was a municipal leader, that would make me a bit nervous. Like if I was looking for stability, um, that doesn't say stability to me. I'm no economist, but uh, that would, I don't know if that would feel like it was going to solve my problems. Now, you and I are both in uh, Calgary, as you mentioned, and I kind of want to sort of poke the bear a little bit here, if you don't mind. Um, that 7.8% tax increase for 2024, that is probably one of the largest tax increases that I've seen the city uh, introduce in some time. What are you hearing from the sort of people on the street? What are you hearing from your coworkers, from your friends, from your family members about this increase? Did Were they expecting it or were they hoping that the, uh, the city would go back to the drawing board and try to reduce it a little bit more? Yeah, good question. I think, um, you know, I think generally Calgarians understand um, that we're at a point where we need revenue and it has to come from somewhere. You can only, you know, squeeze so much. I think what is really challenging for Calgarians, and I'll include myself in this, is the way this formula is calculated is extremely complicated. And I've had many smart people try to explain it to me. <laughs> and it's it's not accessible for the average person to understand as much as, you know, our mayor is very competent in this sort of policy and it tries every budget cycle. Um, it doesn't make sense to Calgarians how this is being calculated and how it's in the end going to impact them. So I think that's the big liability here is less the, the amount. I think, you know, generally people are okay with paying a bit more taxes if they see a return for it. But um, there isn't a lot of buy-in in how this decision is being made or how these numbers are being reached. I'm going to ask the political question a little bit here. We're in the middle of the, we are in the midst of the middle of their term, two years in, two years to the next election. We traditionally see, and I'm saying that from an observer of municipalities from across Canada, that the second year is usually when you try to sort of do this kind of big, great increase. And then year three, year four, you sort of slow down and say, oh, it's going to be 0% or it's going to be 1%. Is this just a sort of hiccup in the route to 2025 when the next municipal election is going to be? <laughs> yeah, it could be. I mean, you definitely saw that around the council table that this is a, a political decision that these you know, councillors are grappling with. At the end of the day, businesses don't vote, people do. Um, <laughs> however, the business lobby here is strong and well-resourced, and they've been at this uh, conversation for a while. And, you know, without being too cynical, I think, you know, you have the political reality is here is that businesses and corporations donate to uh, municipal political campaigns. They are very involved in those elections. So that will be a part of the conversation that if these politicians are running again, they'll have to factor in as well. I, I agree. So for my third top, my, my story that I wanted to talk about for my, I think was the biggest news story third in third place across Alberta goes a little bit to the spicy side as and to sort of take words from you. Um, and my mine was the Cardston, uh, the, the town of Cardston overturned a 100 year ban on prohibition within their city limits. So uh, for the it is one of the last few municipalities in the province of Alberta that is still uh, well, as until mo most recently, I think September when it was officially passed, if I'm remembering correctly, um, still had a prohibition on alcohol sales within city limits of their community. Now, this is not a big story, but I think it's an important story because I think that more municipalities are sort of looking at the times and sort of trying to figure out where they're going to potentially get new sources of revenue to go back to your original story is how do we diversify our economy? And is there things in our past, which Cardston looked at, and this has been an ongoing issue, that we could overturn and potentially see some tourism dollars come in, some uh, business dollars come in. So when I watched this unfold, you could see that there was a very divided council. There were some in favor of the overturning and there were some who were vehemently opposed because it is a more traditional Mormon Latter-day Saints uh, area of the province. So alcohol is looked down upon. Uh, they were afraid that it could change the culture of the community. We have not seen any big stories come out of uh, Cardston yet. This came from the golf course wanting to sell alcohol at the golf course. And here we are. So I think it's a story that we, that didn't really get a lot of attention to begin with, but I think it's a big story in itself because more municipalities are looking at what they're doing, but also what they've done and changing what they've done to sort of reflect the 2023 reality that they're in. But that's just my opinion. 
Yeah, that's a great example that I totally forgot about that one. But that that was interesting to watch too, because from, from what I can recall, Cardston has tried to do this a few times, like, and it's been, you know, shot down year after year. So it's it's a changing times, clearly, if this has made its way through. Well, it's a changing times and it's a changing attitude, right? Because they held a plebiscite. The plebiscite came back saying that they were in favor of overturning the uh, prohibition on alcohol sales. And in the actual, uh, the final vote uh uh, um, council meeting. I, I happened to watch the three hour council meeting where all everyone was going in and talking about why they think they were in favor or why they were opposed to it. The mayor said, I have to leave it up to the citizens. And I was elected as a, your representative. And if your people, if you come back with your plebiscite saying you want it overturned, even if I disagree with it, which I do. I'm going to follow the will of the people. So I think that's where the big story comes in is following the will of the people. We're seeing this play out in Westlock a little bit right now with the Westlock sidewalk and uh, flag bylaw where they didn't want uh, painting of the progressive pride flag. And the city is going to a, the, the town, I should say, is going to a plebiscite in 2024. So will council follow the will of the plebiscite, even if it, they disagree with it. They are a more progressive community, uh, more progressive council, but it is a traditionally more conservative area of the province. So I, I'm just watching these plebiscites pull layout and Cardston is a key factor in that, seeing that they had a plebiscite, they tried to overturn it twice before, and then the third time it finally stuck. But I guess that's... It, it it shows me that people are actually engaged in the matters that actually are important to them. And I guess alcohol was important to Cardston. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure a few people in there. And yeah, those plebiscites, you never know how they're going to go. They're, they're a risky business, but. Uh, well, uh, it, exactly. Yeah. And look at, look what happened in Calgary, right? Calgary 2026 uh, Olympic bid, the plebiscite, people assume that it was going to pass because more people, they would assume, well, from what I hear, spoiler alert, my husband was on the front lines of that plebiscite, uh, being the Minister of Tourism at the time. Uh, you think it's going to pass, but things happen and you have to take the will of the people. And so you have to be cautious of how you use those plebiscites. <laughs> yeah. That's the moral of the story for sure. <laughs> exactly. For you, number two, what was your number two story in Alberta for municipal news? Yeah, this one I feel like it might be a bit under the radar for some of your watchers, maybe not, but I have been really following with just fascination how um, the Métis Nation of Alberta is moving towards a self-government novel model. Um, and it's, you know, not technically municipal, but I think it's you know, kind of is in the way it functions local here in government. Alberta. <laughs> local government, right? This is, if anything is local government, it's this. Uh, the Métis Nation of Alberta got um, some legal rulings from the federal government back in 2019 to make this happen. So they've been working really hard to form, um, like, basically a whole new government. And so even just, you know, from a governance perspective, um, from those of us who are interested in that area, it's really fascinating to watch. They're moving from having um, six regions to 22 districts, so very different model. They have a whole new president, um, it's actually no longer referred to as the Métis Nation of Alberta. It's the Otempiswak Métis government now. And um, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to watch how they lay this out. This new president's going to get to pick a whole new cabinet. They're going to have to figure out how to oversee um, or maybe not oversee how these new districts are going to be run, basically. Are they going to be their own self-governments? Are there going to be elections in every single one? Um, and there's because there's so many of them, I mean, here in Calgary, we've got two, I think, Métis districts dividing up the city. So how is that going to impact, you know, how the Métis are represented? You know, now councillors and MLAs here are going to have two uh, Métis representatives knocking on their doors and lobbying and uh, being strong voices for their communities. So I'm just fascinated to watch how this is going to roll out and to see, you know, how this maybe could be a model for how other Indigenous nations move forward. I, I will be completely blunt. It's not a story that I had. I, I, I had heard rumblings about it because I recently mm -hmm. sat down with a Devon, Alberta councillor, Mike Hanley, who is a member of the Métis Nation. And he was talking about this a little bit in depth. And I just never followed through on learning a little bit more about this. Um, this is this has been ongoing for some time now because if, if, for, for those who travel across the uh, province, you'll see those uh, billboards that say "Have you voted yet?" Uh, or seventy percent of people voted for self governance for the Métis Nation, isn't it? Yeah, it's very high. Yeah, 
what what's on the radar for 2024 for that do you know like have you when you were doing your research on the this issue because i think it's an important issue that we have to watch and maybe we might have to do a follow-up story on this because i think it's an important one what what's on the radar for 2024 because if they're moving to this new self-governance where they're going to be having 22 regions Mm -hmm. instead of the six are they going to have new special elections or have they already held special elections do you know my understanding, Chris, is I think first off is the new president's going to pick her cabinet. Um, that will be her focus going into the new year. I don't think they've decided on the governance model for these new districts, which is why it's kind of fascinating to watch. There isn't really a precedent for how these are run. Um, so it might be kind of, you know, a local grassroots structure and how they're run. They might be more formal elections. I don't think they've decided yet. So that will be, you know, top of mind for this new organization to figure out. And what do you mean by cabinet ministers? Do you know? Um, I'm not sure yet if they're going to have portfolios or what that's going to look like, like a traditional cabinet. Um, that's what I've I've been told by the the organization is what they're focusing on. So I, I don't think they even know what that's going to look like yet. I, I think it's going to be one that we'll have to watch a little bit more in depth. Um, yeah. My second story harks back to about middle of June, uh, middle of June, beginning of June. And this is kind of, it's not a municipal issue. It's more of a provincial issue, but has municipal ramifications. And that is the replacing of Rebecca Schultz as Minister of Municipal Affairs with Rick McIver. Now, prior to the election, I sat down with many municipal leaders from across uh, Alberta, and particularly those at Alberta municipalities. And the one thing I heard over and over again after the election and Danielle Smith had won was, we hope that Rebecca Schultz stays in as municipal affairs because we had a good working relationship with her. Unfortunately, she gets, uh, well, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, uh, she gets shuffled into the environment portfolio and Smith brings back sort of uh, someone who she had shuffled out of cabinet and put him back into cabinet. And that is the Honorable Rick McIver. And now everyone will say it, it, whatever they want after a, a, a cabinet change, but everyone was happy because they had someone who was, uh, well, who was informative on the issues that were addressing uh, municipalities as a former alderman for the city of Calgary. He had been in the, that position beforehand under Jason Kenney and under, well, for a few days under Premier Smith. And he was, I, even if I'm not mistaken, he goes back even into the Stelm or the Prentice years and even the uh, Hancock years. But I'm, don't quote me on that for those who are watching right now. I, I think his appointment into that position signaled to municipalities, and this is just me saying it as a political observer, I think it signaled to municipalities that you have someone in our government, because traditionally municipalities' issues aren't really forefront, you have someone in the cabinet who understands what you need and is sort of will hopefully be advocating for your issues around that cabinet table. There was a few choices that Smith could have chosen, but I think she went with the steady hand instead of ruffling the feathers. And that's just my personal opinion. I've met with Minister McIver. I've sat down with him. He's been on the show. And I get the sense that he is more of a steady hand, more than a, we're going to cause some rough feathers, ruffled feathers here. What did you think about that appointment? Yeah, I know. I remember when... um. I'm glad you brought this one up because it, it was kind of a big shift. I feel like it, it sent a very different message than had been sent to municipalities before. And I know we sat down and chatted right after that. And we kind of said it could kind of go both ways. Like, you know, Minister McIver knows this file so well, he could get in there and do some work right off the ground. Like he doesn't need to be briefed up. He's probably coming into it knowing what he wants to do. He has the networks. He could just sort of get started or he could be to your point to kind of hold the road don't cause, don't rock the boat, don't cause any big changes sort of leader. And I think we've we've ended up seeing the second one. I would agree with you for sure. I was kind of racking my mind to even think about what he's done in his mandate so far. And I, uh, besides what we're, I'm sure we're going to talk about very soon. Um, I can't think about uh, too many things that he's, you know, checked off his mandate letter. Like you mentioned, he's got this big funding um, piece that he has to figure out. Um, I guess maybe the arena deal he was involved in, so like that could maybe be a feather in his cap. But yeah, he's generally been a very quiet minister. Um, so that, uh, yeah, that that sends an interesting message to municipalities yeah. for sure, and maybe not what they were hoping for. 
And I think it sends a message to Edmonton as well, because mm-hmm. when when they so for those who don't remember, for those who didn't watch our original episode after the provincial election, um, Edmonton shut out the UCP. So there's no uh, representative from the uh, government party who represents any part of the city of Edmonton. And this is unusual because usually there's one or two. Last term, there was Casey Madu. But this election, this term, there is no one from the city of Edmonton on the government benches. And McIver has those connections within the municipal sort of stakeholders. He may know a few more people than traditionally someone who is new to the game, because and let's be honest, most most municipalities, there aren't big turnovers at the uh, administration level than there are than say provincial or federal. So I think his connections in Edmonton help him a little bit and help the Smith government sort of work with the city rather than sort of be at instigator than that some might see would be. (laughs) Yeah, good point. And, you know, he's a Calgary based minister too. So he's got the relationships here and he can kind of straddle both sides. So he's, um, I'm sure internally very useful, but I think just externally, we haven't seen much. No, and I and I'll agree with that because there's not much. There hasn't been much going on. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens in budget 2024 with him because if he advocates for more funding for municipalities, that's going to be great. If he doesn't, then there's going to be some issues. So it is going to be sort of a wait and see. But I think it's a big move on her part, Smith's uh, Premier Smith's part, to put him back into that position. But that's just my personal opinion. <laughs> um, before we get to the big story, and I, I think we 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 we're in agreement on what that will be. And I think that's going to take much more time. I want to ask you about what the story was that you thought should have gotten more attention across Alberta in the last 12 months, because I have one that was just recently. And I want to know what you thought was your biggest uh, sort of non-story, but should have been a story. Yeah, this was definitely a non-story. Um, back in September, Alberta municipalities had their convention like they always do. And I know you and I were both watching very closely. They had a very interesting <laughs> presidential race going on. <laughs> it's, you know, it's not quite the White House, but it's uh, it can tell you a lot about what's going on in municipal politics. I always find, I know you go to those conventions, like they're always just a fascinating bellwether on how municipalities are feeling and like who they want out there representing them. Um, they had, I think there were three people in the race. There was... Um, someone from Legal, uh, we had Councillor Chabot here from Calgary running, and then of course the uh, the person who won. Um, Tyler Gandum. Gandum, thank you. From Wetaska win, how could I forget? Cars cause less. Um, so a really interesting race to watch because like three very different people and um, we know Councillor Chabot has been involved in Alberta, Alberta municipalities for quite a while. Like this is really where he's comfortable. He reports back to council here regularly on it. He sat on the board, I think probably for his whole term. Um, I was trying to figure that out and it's like, it goes back so far. I couldn't even find <laughs> documentation. So he's well known there. He's well trusted. And then, yeah, our, our boy Councillor Chabot didn't win and he actually didn't even come close. Um, I was shocked by the, the vote share. And so I know that seems like very internal politics, but I think it sends a a really clear message about who municipalities want speaking for them. Um, and I thought maybe someone from a big city might be useful because so many of the challenges they were putting forward in that convention had to do with big cities, with downtowns and arenas and these things. But um, no, they want someone from a who can, you know, connect that rural voice and maybe that sort of midtown mayor approach. Um, they think that's what's going to connect with their stakeholders. So that was um, that was really interesting to watch for me. It, it- Okay, so I I had that on my list. So I was back and forth between my story and this story. And the reason why I wanted to talk about that story, and I'm so glad you brought it up that I didn't have to bring it up so I could talk about my story as well, was that Chabot, this was Chabot's second kick at the can. So he ran originally in 2021 against uh, Premier, uh, well, not Premier, uh, President Heron, uh, then Mayor of Vice President Heron. Uh, and he came in second. He ran again. Um, I think it's no secret that he did not serve on any boards or any uh, committees during the two years between the last presidential election and this presidential election. And when I was on the ground, I knew it was going to be a two-way race. I, I will be the completely blunt and upfront with that. You, you knew it was going to come down to Trina Jones of Legal and Tyler Gandum from Wetaskiwin. And there was some serious unknown because people didn't know what it was going to go. And you had these two sort of rural urban mayors 
fighting over sort of the same piece of the pie and you heard some rumblings was is Chabot going to win because there's going to be a split unfortunately oh, that didn't happen exactly unfortunately that didn't happen because i think he got nine percent of the vote and the other two got like i think 40 and 20 percent i'm not i'm doing some basic math in my head right now if i can remember correctly but i think it, it was a good story because mm-hmm. i think gandam is a complete different entity than heron and i say that from a, 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 an observer's perspective and i just want to get your opinion on it mm-hmm. heron was no right he she was out there she was out there trying to connect with all the municipalities tyler gandam well known in alberta municipalities but i don't think the average resident of alberta the average albertan would know who tyler gandam is and i'm not trying to say that as a bad thing i'm just saying he has some pretty big shoes to fill in uh uh, president heron's uh, shoes so let's see if he can do it yeah no agreed i mean if i was a if i was a betting woman i would have bet on trina jones for sure (laughs) She had a lot more buttons at that campaign I at that did. convention. I will say that. <laughs> um, I want to talk about one that just happened last month. And this is my story that I think should have gotten a lot more news because I think it happens a lot more, but it, this is unusual. Hinton, Alberta mayor, Marcel Michaels resigned early in August to take over the, uh, take to become the CEO of, I believe, Consort Alberta. And in that, his vacancy uh, left a by-election requirement, which was called for November. One of the sitting councillors uh, who served on council with Marcel resigned his council seat to run for the position of mayor because you can't hold the same position. Uh, he was challenged. The councillor was challenged by an outsider who had no political experience. He did not have any experience in the political arena or with City Hall in any election that I can find data going back to. So he was kind of a green candidate. And what I find fascinating, I think should have been a bigger story across uh, Alberta, was the councillor who resigned to run for mayor was defeated. And so Councillor Brian Labrage, I believe his name is, ran for mayor, was probably expecting to win because traditionally if you're on council, that is seen as a stepping stone and was kind of handedly defeated by about 150 votes, if I'm not mistaken, but still a substantial amount of votes. And he, so he loses the mayor's seat. He's no longer on council. And this new first term mayor who has no political experience is now the head of Hinton, Alberta's council table. I find it fascinating for two reasons. One, it shows you that you can, if you're going to have the political will to run, you better know that it's locked up. So for the councillor who ran and was uh, unfortunately defeated, I'm he's now back to just being an average citizen. Maybe he's okay with that. Maybe he's not. But I find it fascinating because we're seeing this play out, uh, uh, sort of play out in Westlock right now because their mayor, Ralph Goling, just resigned. One of the councillors resigned a day after to run for mayor. There's, but there are uh, nomination dates the 13th. There are by-elections in 2024. I have way too much knowledge in my head. I really need to stop t- dealing with municipalities and by-elections. Um, so... And so will this sort of be a precursor to what happened in Hinton? Will the councillor who resigned to take a run at the mayor's chair, will he be defeated? Will he be successful? We saw the successful candidate in Slave Lake. The mayor stepped down. A councillor stepped down to run for mayor. She got elected. So it it really shows you that you have to be prepared to lose if you're going to sort of take a political risk of stepping down halfway through council term and running. That's my big story. Oh, right? yeah. That's brutal. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I have a bit of experience of running for something and then having someone come in who hasn't been there winning. And it's, uh, it's brutal. <laughs> you know, it's not fun. And uh, I, uh, yeah, I wonder maybe if it's time to look at that rule. And, you know, because traditionally, if you run, if you're running for office, you kind of take a leave of absence from your job. You know, that's usually what would be expected for most people, which in itself is a lot to ask, I think, for any kind of, you know, it's, 
it selects out some people who can't afford to maybe potentially lose their job or even take a few months off. So, it's- well, yeah, to, to sort of contradict you there for a second, because I'm going to at the municipal level, it's a different beast, right? Now, if we were talking about the city of Edmonton or city of Calgary, it'd be like, okay, yeah, maybe take a leave of absence and run for mayor. But in a small town, the mayor is not a full time job. The council is not a full time job. So it's like two hundred to four hundred dollars a month that you're getting extra. Some re- Renumerations are probably a little bit different, but in the municipality that I worked for, I think the mayor got like six hundred dollars a month, ooh, <laughs> for a full time job. So, I j- you just have to be c- careful, and I would not want to s- sort of step back from council, still be a councillor, run for mayor, get elected as mayor, and then have to hold yeah. another by election, yeah. which are not pretty pennies. But that, that I think true. that's our first argument there, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, yeah, no, so I, 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 I'm cautious of time. We're going to talk about the big, uh, biggest news story municipally across Canada, but I'm just, I, I'll, uh, I'll ask you, you don't have to go into detail, but what did you think it was? Because I think we need to go into detail about the next, the big story of 2023. So it, across Canada, what did you see as the biggest municipal news story? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can talk about uh, the impact to municipalities on a national level without talking about wildfires and climate change and what's going on. That's what I picked. I think, you know, every story I was researching sort of came back um, to just this this big puzzle piece that municipalities, you know, they, the FCM has been advocating for this new municipal framework. And I think what's happening with wildfires and extreme weather situations is showcasing um, how critical this could be. You know, municipalities are getting downloaded, all this infrastructure responsibility, all this frontline service responsibility. And these disasters are happening, you know, they're happening on the ground in communities. They're not happening in legislatures. This is where this work is going to keep happening and where these challenges are going to keep happening. And I think also, you know, I've raised this previously, but for me, it really shows too just how disconnected some of these other levels of government are from these issues. Um, you know, I was looking a bit at what um, what FCM was advocating for ahead of the various budgets, and so little of it got reflected in, you know, the federal budgets and what we've seen from politicians. We've seen a lot of lip service, a lot of kind of like handshaking photo ops, but at the end of the day, like not a single thing in the budget for, you know, things like like housing or wildfires or climate change. So um, yeah, you know, if I was a municipal leader and I was thinking about like what I was advocating for and what I was pushing for on a national level, I think I would be really worried about next summer. I I would uh, completely agree with you. I, I, I This is why I love having you on because you talk, you take the pragmatic route. I'm like, I'm talking about the political side of everything. I think the biggest political news story municipally across Canada was the election of Olivia Chow as mayor of the city of Toronto. And I could not get through uh, this, uh, this show without talking about this for two seconds. I think it's important for two different reasons. One, I think it gives the uh, Toronto sort of a little bit of a boost being fr- uh, from former John Tory, who was seen more of a conservative sort of steady as she go. Olivia Chow is kind of shaking up the Ontario political spectrum a little bit because she's working with Doug Ford, the premier of Ontario. She is working with Justin Trudeau, and it's a not not often you see three levels of government working together while still sort of being angry at each other because We could talk for a full hour just on the issues that Toronto faces itself, but Olivia Chow has sort of changed the narrative around what the city of Toronto is going to get when it comes to both the federal and provincial governments. And it's not often when a mayor, no matter what size of community or where you are in Canada, can change the narrative of municipal relationships with the provincial and federal governments with just an election prior to even her being sworn in the prime minister was be, was coming out and trying to meet with her the premier was coming out when gondek and so he were elected in edmonton and alberta i didn't see uh, jason kenny or justin trudeau making big announcements saying congratulations to the new incoming mayors but that's just my own personal opinion what do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, I am glad you picked that one, Chris. I thought about that too. I don't uh, admittedly know a whole lot about Toronto. I'm a very Alberta girl, so I t- like to not think about Ontario as much as I can. <laughs> Didn't you hear Toronto's the center of the universe, don't you know? Oh, well, you know, we let them think that, but uh, that's true. <laughs> we know so, the truth out here. But they... I, 
Yeah. Go ahead. What I think is interesting, what I do think is interesting with Olivia Chow is she's had like an incredible career. Um, and she's, you know, one of these sort of like people you could call a stateswoman. And there's not a whole lot of them because it's brutal to go through your career being involved in politics, especially, you know, the high profile partner she had. Um, she has been, I think from what I can remember, she's been like a school board trustee. She's been a counselor. She's run for office many times. Like this woman has been through it. And so if there's anyone who's like tough enough <laughs> to do this job and like do this work, you've been saying that she's clearly doing like i think it's her yeah i agree wholeheartedly so <laughs> before you to recording i we we kind of jokingly said uh, we're pretty sure what we know was the biggest municipal news story across alberta uh and uh, jennifer we, we didn't even have to mention what the story was jennifer and i both agreed with this so i'm gonna so for those who are about to listen what jennifer's about to say is the reason i i picked it as well so jennifer for you what did you think was the biggest municipal news story across alberta in 2020 23 and reminder we're recording this on december 5th not coming out for another two weeks so it could change but as of december 5th what did you think was the biggest that's political great well, <laughs> as of december 5th i mean grab your popcorn because minister mciver fired the mayor and three city councilors and a few administration in the city of chestermere um and this has been you know a long history i'm sure you've talked about it this a bit before in your podcast, Chris, so you know, I won't take your listeners through the whole story, but um, there's been quite a journey to get here. There's been independent reviews done. There's been, you know, Minister McIver, or I guess it was Minister Schultz actually sent them a letter, um, did a review. And then, no, actually it was Minister McIver that sent them the letter with some some requests to make changes to how they were run. They, um, you know, not only did the council say, no, we're not doing that. They also said, we're going to take legal action against you. That's where it was, you know, a few weeks ago when we first chatted about it. Um, and so, yeah, we saw yesterday Minister McIver actually pulled the plug and uh, let uh, some councillors and the mayor go. So, I mean, this is a huge story. It's so unprecedented, um, it, you know, just from a political theater to kind of watch how this all plays out. We don't see this very often and um, it's kind of, you know, interesting to watch. But I think it also has like some serious repercussions on what this means for like the powers that provincial governments have over municipalities, I you know was mentioning earlier, Chris. I found myself reading through the MGA yesterday, which I definitely do not enjoy doing in my spare time. But I was just so curious, like, what does this document actually say? And it's very vague. Um, the minister's taken, you know, definitely some liberties with how he's interpreting this, um, and it really calls into question, you know, when else can ministers do this? Um, well, you know, as much as you might support what Minister McIver did and how you feel about. Chestermere City Council. There have been other city councils that had problems. Um, you know, definitely here in Calgary, we have a councillor that broke the law and the mayor here was trying to get him off council and ask the province to do it. And they said, no, we can't do it. So there's already been some inconsistencies in how this is applied. And so it, it could be a bit of a worrying precedent as kind of fun and entertaining it is to watch. I, I I agree wholeheartedly. It, it, there is no precedent set here because traditionally you don't go in and you don't fire a mayor and council without due cause. And it seems like they did their due diligence. And even McIver said in his press conference yesterday, uh, yesterday December 4th, um, that they sent letters. They asked for they appointed an official administrator, which the three CAOs. I don't know how you have three CEO, uh, CAOs in a city of that size, but here we are. Uh, three CAOs. Uh, would be reporting to the mayor and council would report to the, uh, the official administrator as well. The province would get their directions, would give their directions to the official administrator. And this has been an ongoing saga. This is not something that just happened overnight. It's taken almost a good year because Minister Schultz in March of this year sort of laid out the framework in the gymnasium in Chestermere. And then a bylo then the provincial election happened. Minister McIver sworn in. He says he's going to still continue, hold the city of Chestermere. Chestermere sort of says, uh-uh, <laughs> we don't think what you're doing is legally right, which they had the right to say. And they... To, to quote the people who often say it, they effed around and they found out what, what happens when you don't follow the rules. We often forget, and I think this is the big thing I want to say here, municipalities are the direct responsibility of the province. The federal government cannot do this. The provinces are the only ones who can go in and actually fire and change the way that the municipalities are being run. That's their purview. That's their jurisdictional purview as a province. 
We have seen official administrators being appointed before in villages and towns. Uh, one of my friends is an official administrator in two of the communities up north. Uh, we just saw the village of Carbon under official administrator role because they had members of their council just up and quit because they just couldn't take it anymore. So this is not unprecedented for the official administrator role. What is unprecedented, and th this is where I want to get to, is the firing of the mayor and three councils. So Council of Chestermere has seven members. Three council members are still councillors, but they have no responsibility until quorum is met later next year. Sorry, I have to get this on the table here. Um, what I find fascinating is the mayor went in and said, we're going to fire these three, the one, because these were the problem children. These were the ones that they saw was the biggest issue facing them. I don't know... And I, I've been trying to grapple with this Sean Chu issue. For those who are listening outside of uh, Calgary, uh, Jennifer, uh, outside of Edmonton or Alberta, uh, Jennifer just mentioned a counselor in Calgary. That is Sean Chu, Ward 4. There are some allegations against him, and I say allegations because I do not know the full story, and I'm only going by what the CBC reported in the 2021 election. Uh, I, I don't see the coalition of where the bad governance comes into play compared to with the bad governance that was going on in Chestmere. I think the two surveys that the province launched with asking candidates to potentially unveil any criminal past is a interesting step to rectify that situation that is happening in Ward 4 of City of Calgary. But this, the province has to look at governance and only governance when it comes to the the firing of these councillors. And if Sean Chu's not giving good governance, then there's a potential right to kick him out. But I'm assuming he's still going to council and voting on the issues that are important to his con community. But that's not that we're not here to talk about Sean Chu. We're here to talk about Chas Brown. What I find fascinating in the future is how is the city going to move forward. I put a request in for information from the minister to say, minister, can these four men, all men, can they run for the upcoming by-election? I have not heard anything as of the recording this, so maybe later on I'll have a little bit more information. But if they can, they could potentially still get elected, and then we're back to square one. So firing them is one thing. Can they still run? That's going to be my big story of 2024. Yeah, it'll be fascinating to watch um, because I think, you know, from what I can remember, like this mayor won pretty handily. Like, I think he's pretty popular. Um, not and, according you know, to these... Facebook. You look on the Chestermere rant and I could tell you he is not a popular man right now. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the local news reporter doesn't seem <laughs> fond of him either. But I mean, regardless of what you think of these guys, like they won. They won democratically. They, you know, most of them won their seats pretty handily. And so I think that is something we have to you know, consider a lot of people voted for these individuals that the government has just dismissed. And, you know, what does that mean for the the morale of the citizenry and how they're going to feel about their government? So before I let you go, do you have anything to add on this? Because I am cautious of time and I know you have to go here potentially. Regarding Chestermere as a whole, mm -hmm. do you see this being sort of the end of the story? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think you raised some good points about what this by-election is going to look like. I, From what I can tell from this mayor and these three councillors that were let go, I don't think they're going to go without a fight. I don't think they're, you know, going to retire and, you know, paint Oh, there will dogs. be a lawsuit. There will be a lawsuit. <laughs> yes. I, I am putting my money on that. Yeah. If I was a betting man, I'd say there'd be a lawsuit. Yeah, I agree. I think, the, I don't think they're going to let it die, whether they can win again in a by-election. Like, we'll, we'll see them. Maybe they'll run for the UCP nomination or something. Like, I think politically, like, I, I think this is a long-term theater. Um, and they do have support. Like, Mayor Colvin does have people there, even if it's not showing up on Facebook. But I, I he won well. So he has support there. So I'm sure they're making some plans. Um, but I think, you know, the more interesting question is what does this mean for other municipalities too? And, um, you know, does, is, does Minister McIver have his eye on other councils that he believes are ineffective, other councillors he believes are ineffective, or is this a one-off? Um, they just wanted to kind of get rid of this one problem child. And that, I don't know, that'll be interesting to watch. I, I can tell you that off the record, this is just what I've been hearing through the grapevine, that 
a lot of municipalities, a lot of municipal leaders have been watching this with very tense eyes because they're seeing what ha- is happening in Chestermere as sort of a catalyst of potentially what could happen in other municipalities. So you are completely right there. What happens in one is sets a precedent and it could potentially move over to others. So maybe this is a wake up call for a lot of municipal leaders to say, okay, am I actually offering good governance to the people of my community? And now we, we, we now know what a poster child is for bad governance in the province of Alberta when it comes to municipalities. Yep. So that's true. Um, Jennifer, uh, one last question before I let you go here, and that is 2024. I know I did not prepare you for this question, <laughs> but I'm going to ask it anyway. What are you going to be watching for in 2024? Is there any municipal related news? You talked about the wildfires, you talked about budget 2024, but is there anything you'll be specifically watching for? Because we'll, we're certainly going to have you back on, on in 2024. Yeah, I can't wait. It's going to be a fascinating year. You know, we're going to have, like you mentioned, another budget from the provincial government that's uh, going to have to say something about affordable housing, whether they want to or not, it's going to have to be in there. So that's going to be fascinating to watch. Um, You know, like you also alluded to here in Calgary, city council is definitely kind of ramping up for their election. You can feel a little bit of the election silliness in the air. And there's a lot of unanswered questions about who's running again, is the mayor running again? yeah, a lot from what I from what I hear, people don't know. So that will be a really important thing to watch, I think, here, because it does set the tone for, I think, a lot of the surrounding area as well, what that election looks like. Uh, it's certainly one that, one election I'll be watching, A, because I'm, I'm from Calgary, but it is uh, an important election nonetheless. Uh, the one thing I'll be watching for, and it's kind of a big one, and that is the Federation of Canadian Municipalities will be meeting in April of 2024, right here in downtown Calgary. Right. So uh, hopefully Jennifer will be able to take an afternoon off one day and come to a live show right at FCM. And we'll be talking about some of the municipal issues that are happening in the province with a national audience from people across Canada. So that is the one story I'll be watching for sure, because uh, Scott Pierce's uh, tenure as president is coming to an end. Jeff Stewart, the second vice president, the deputy re- deputy mayor of Colchester, Nova Scotia, will be taking over as president for his one term. And we will see a new vice president on the table. So it's going to be an interesting, uh, I would say, few months, but it'll be an interesting convention because we will be part of it this year so that's oh, what i'll be watching <laughs> jennifer as always it's a pleasure to sit down with you and talk about this i feel uh our our usual half hour is now about an hour i think we're about just about 45 minutes in so thank you so much for taking 45 minutes out of your day to do this and chat and talk about the uh, the provincial and uh municipal stories that were making the headlines of 2023 great to be here chris thanks mm-hmm. And that's all for our year in review episode for this 2023. We'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude for all of those who have tuned in and watched. Your support means the world to us. Remember, our mission is to bring you the most important municipal stories from across Canada and around the world. And we can't do that without you. So please keep those stories coming. Share your municipal news your concerns, and even your municipal triumphs with us. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in our communities, and your voices are essential to that mission. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.